Um, her enthusiasm, her energy, charisma, her passion uh, definitely makes a major difference in everything that Rage does in an organization. Um, and for me, it's just like it's been like almost like a changing of the guards a little bit. Not that he's gone, but like Randy Hirsch with that enthusiasm and energy that helped kick off that uh, that program and organization. And now Faye, like you've created something that this this poem is exactly what I've been saying Rage needed for so many years. A place that was not institutional, but a place, a home that people could walk into, feel comfortable, like they, they could just do what they do in their own home and not not, not judgmental. A home and an environment which is comfortable and welcoming to everybody. That's what this place is. I feel very welcome here. Thank you so much for everything. I do have, I do have, sorry, yes, I do have an ulterior motive. And that's not about Ronnie Hirsch having started Rage yeah. and being taken over by Faye yeah. Zakon. Yeah. Tonight we're announcing that Ronnie Hirsch and Faye Zakon are working together on Rage.
that's meaningful for a young group of people whose heritage was completely robbed and stolen from them. And I, I really do, I believe that. Like my mission uh, at that range was always thinking about how these people that I'm speaking in front of, like the people who I live in my house, the people who I'm traveling around the world with, were individuals whose families were robbed of heritage, and I didn't get the position to try to give them some meaning, an opportunity to reacquaint them with something that actually belonged to them. And certainly, Lag Omer, as part of the holiday, is a holiday that most Russians don't know about. Right? Most Jews don't even know about Lag uh, And the question is, what is it that we're celebrating? The, 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 uh, the basic concept for tonight is this, this question of the power of unity. And I want to use this as a way of kind of inspiring the group here Guys, these guys are these super rubbish people. These guys are going to come out and educate and change the world. That's what Rabbi Kiva wanted. 
his whole purpose of his five students were to come out and make a difference. But what ends up happening is surprising, okay? Not true, right? They, they emerge from the cave, right? And they see people, right, who are plowing and sowing the field. And Rabbi Shubha Yachai says, these people, they abandon an, an eternal life for their own sustenance. Who are the losers of these people? Right? That every place, the Gemara says that every place that Rishim on and his son Rabbi Lazar directed their eyes, immediately burnt into flames. They literally got like laser vision and they're setting everything on fire. Right? So, listen, I've learned from the Bimini Drash, I've been 12 years, but I don't know anyone that walked out of the Drash now has, you know, like superman powers to like, burn things up. Things up, things up. That doesn't work like that. So, whenever the Gemara says something that's interesting, we have to ask the question what are we supposed to learn from that? How do we understand the story? Like these guys were sitting, they were learning, they were engaged in spiritual development, they're coming out and they see a, they see a guy who's, what are you doing? He's got a job, right? He's supporting his family. Why does this guy deserve to be set on fire and burnt, right? A heavenly voice comes out and says to them, did you come out of this cave and destroy my world? You gotta go back to the cave that you come from. In the more academic circles, by the way, if you're familiar with Aristotle, the allegory of the cave, this story is the antithesis of that story, but that's for another time. So uh, they sat in this, uh, they sat in this, it's interesting, right? They sat in, they go back into the cave, and uh, they wait for 12 months. You say 12 months is the amount of time that when a soul is judged, you get no one's less than 12 months, it must be we can emerge after 12 months. And they're, they're, as they're debating it, a divine voice comes out and says, get out of the cave, you come out of the cave. So they come out of the cave. Now, everywhere that Rabbi Lazar would look at, he would set on fire, and Rabbi, Sh- and Rabbi Shimon, his father, would heal it. So he's just had another 12 months. He didn't learn the lesson the first time. You're coming out, you're setting everything on fire. And now the father, for some reason, he has a change of heart. We don't know why, but his son is still burning everything up. So uh, the Quran records, he says that Rabbi Shimon, Bar Yochai, says to his son, Allah, so he says, my son, he says, I don't know, Right? The world, it would have been enough just for the two of us in the world. Like, don't, don't, don't get too excited about, you know, what's going on. Just our own stuff is good. Don't worry about it. It's just like a weird response. Like, how is that helping the situation? Now, you think that at this point, you know, Rabbi Shimon or Lazar would learn some kind of tolerance, right? Um, this is not tolerance at all. This is still intolerance. The fact that he's got to heal, he's got to say this word, we don't worry about it. Like, they're, they're, they're losers, basically. And the world just, just for the two of us, it's enough for the two of us. Forget about everybody else. How is that a response, even, from the rabbi? So, but he continues. Okay, the Gemara continues. And it says like this. It says, by that it says that the sun was setting, right, it's Erev Shabbat, and they saw an elderly man who's holding two bundles of hadassim, of, 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 of myrtle branches, right? And uh, they're, they're running, they're, 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 it's getting really late, Shabbat's coming, and they said to this guy, the rabbi and his son said, this guy, why are you holding these two bundles of myrtle? So he says, I have this to honor Shabbat. So why two? He says, one for Shamor, one for Zahor, one for the remembering, and the other for safeguarding. So Rabbi Shimon turns to his son and says, as we come up and read Mitzvot Al Yisrael, see how dear, how dear these mitzvot, how beloved these mitzvot are for the Jewish people. Right? And it says that it's Yakta Datayu, that their minds were put at ease. They were no longer upset at what they saw, and uh, they were they were happy. That's the end of the Gemara. And we're supposed to walk away feeling like comfortable about that story. I'm so uncomfortable with that story. It's actually it's actually disturbing. It's super troubling. So the question is, what are we meant to learn from the story? Right. Um, so I have a couple. Of, there's a couple of ways of understanding it. Um, these ideas are, are based on several different sources that I kind of put together. So um, it does it make sense for you? Um, there's no question <coughs> that a key component of Judaism is spirituality, right? Now, spirituality is a very difficult thing to control. Spirituality is ruach, right? It's a spirit. It's uncontrollable. It's power. It's massive. It's, it's ginormous. And if you take that powerful spirit and you put it into something that does not have the ability to maintain, control, direct that kind of spirit, that only will burn the people around you but you'll burn yourself. I can't tell you how many times that people have come off of a race trip and say, Rabbi, I am ready to like change my life. And I'm like, slow down, Sparky. You're not going anywhere. Right? You're not going anywhere. There's one particular student 
to Tiffany, way back when. <coughs> a 16-year-old uh, girl that came to my house that helped me some chesed a long time ago. And uh, she decided to go to seminary, and she came back from seminary. And she's like, Rabbi, you do this Rosh Hashanah. Can I, can I spend time with your family? Rosh Hashanah, my family doesn't keep uh, the holiday. Can I spend time with you? I'm like, no, can't, sorry. She's like, what do you mean? She, I'm like, you have to learn how to live with your parents. Like, your parents, like, who's going to teach your parents Rosh Hashanah? It's not going to be me. They're not coming to my house. You're going to do it. She told me a few, a few days before her wedding, she's like, I want you to know, she's like, I was so angry with you. I never felt so abandoned by someone who I trusted so much. How could you do that to me? She said, but now, at the wedding, her wedding, her mom comes up to me and says, Rabbi, I know what you did with my daughter. <laughs> 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 I want to thank you because she told me how she wanted to go to your house and you wouldn't let her. And then you forced her to spend the time with us. And she said, I appreciate the holiday so much more now because of that. So thank you so much for what you did. So this is a classic example. Some kids expired. They want to go ahead and express their Judaism in the coolest way possible. But they don't know, they don't they just don't understand how to express it in a way that's meaningful to the people around them. And for me, you know, like I, my family, I didn't grow up religious, so when the word religious is a, a very um, derogatory word in the Russian language. Yosni uh, is a very bad word. And, uh, you know, the religious people are the crazy people, they're the fanatics, they're the hoping for the masses people. That's not what you want to be a part of. You want to stay away from all those religious people. And I understood that the reason why my parents felt that way is because often religious people would create so many obstacles to building a relationship. I think we're not going to know what you're talking about, Rabbi. Right? So, you know, it creates so many obstacles to building that relationship that they're just like strange. It's just a weird thing. Like, just be normal. Right? Just be normal. And what was happening in this four years ago was that a machine only spent 12 years internalizing these very deep spiritual messages, these very deep spiritual ideas, and he did not know how to contain himself. So he's literally setting the world on fire. Because in his eyes, if you're not involved in any kind of spirituality, it's tantamount to death. You don't deserve to be alive. That was the spirit of coming from. But he had to turn apart. He realized he was too extreme. But not his son. His son did not, was not able to internalize the message. So Rabbi Shimon is now working on healing the world. He doesn't work on stopping his son. Because he's still, his son will align with his son. So he's healing, he's fixing. Whatever he prays, I'll fix. It's like a father-child relationship, you know. I'm not ready to go ahead and reprimand him and give him the discipline that he needs, but I'll start fixing the things that this guy breaks. So I'm fixing and fixing and fixing things. And now there's something that changes at the end of the story. Right? What happens? And instead of them sitting there and looking and judging the world, what do they do? They engage. They see a man carrying these two Myrtle branches, two bundles of uh, myrtle. Right? Instead of saying, set the guy on fire and heal him, what do they do? They ask the question, where are you going? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? And to their pleasant surprise, what they were, what he was involved in was beautiful. It may not have been what they wanted, but they still were able to see the beauty of the fact that this guy was engaged in something so simple as getting some flowers for Shabbat and trying to make Shabbat more meaningful. He wasn't the guy that was the for 12 years. That wasn't his job. He was the guy that was working the field, and for him, for him, that was his beautiful, unique way of expressing his Judaism. Right? It's powerful. So what ends up happening is like this: you have two people that are coming from a world hyper, super focused, my way or the highway, hypercritical, right? Cancel culture will set you on fire, right? Do not try to change my mind on anything. I'm not going to engage in any conversation, and I suspect, I believe. But the reason why the Gemara is telling us this is because Rabbi Shimon was a student of Rabbi Akiva, which means that he, his philosophy, this ideology of my way or the highway, I'm not saying he came from Rabbi Akiva or not, but maybe that's something similar that the students of Rabbi Akiva were suffering from. That they were unable to give kabod one to the other. It's like a basic principle of just respecting somebody. How can you not give couples to your parents? How can you not give, how can you not have, how can you not have just simple gratitude to the people that have helped you and done so much for you? See, I feel so indebted 
so many people that helped me get to where I am. I don't forget them. I pray for them. I think about them all the time. But are we those kind of people that shape the world around us? And if we are those kind of people, we fail to learn the lesson of what it means to be a Jew. To be a Jew means to be someone that has a tremendous amount of, of oda, right? A tremendous amount of, of gratitude, simple <coughs> desire to feel grateful, to be thankful for the things that we have. And maybe she wants to do that in the case. She wants to burn the world that God created for him. That's not why we're here. Religion is not meant to be the Taliban. We come ahead and with set everything on fire because we don't like the way it is. We, we're supposed to be engaged in the conversation. There's a healing process in the Gemara of what Rabbi she wanted to sort of go through to be able to appreciate the nuances of humanity. And the thing that I think that, for me, what encapsulates it is the fact that the Gemara could have told me a story of anything they saw. Right? They could have seen you know, a guy giving tzedakah. They could have seen a guy doing something else. But it wasn't. It was specifically Shabbat. Shabbat is a time of holiness. It's a time of elevating the material into something that is spiritual. It's a time where I'm engaging in all of the material. I'm having a beautiful meal, I'm having people out of my house, I'm having all the desserts, I'm having my own own. We're doing what we can to engage in the material world, but they're elevating it because they're using the material to something more. That was the lesson of, of, of Rabbi Shimon, something that he uh, learned in a very, through a very difficult circumstance, but ultimately was able to uh, you know, impart to his, uh, his, his children. Now, we know that there's a precursor to uh, Matan Torah, right? There's a precursor for the Jewish people to be able to be able to receive the Torah. Why did God create the world? Right? I think that's the most Why did God create the world? The classical answer that we get, I think is the, the best answer. I don't know, I don't know anyone else that attempts to give him an answer, is the Ramchal. The Ramchal says, you don't have a The reason why God created the world is because all the says that you've done and God creates the world with kindness, and the reason why he created the world is to bestow kindness to humanity. At the very least, all we can do as human beings, we want to mimic the Almighty. Our job is to go ahead and just be kind people at the simplest level. And I say this all the time. And I have a family member who is a, uh, considers himself to be an atheist, but really he's agnostic. But, um, you know, he says to him, you know, God will forgive you for not keeping your Shabbat. God will forgive you for not keeping kosher. God will forgive you for, uh, you know, whatever laws you are uncomfortable with doing. But he will not forgive you for not having, for not having common decency. He will not forgive you for not being able to just show gratitude to the people that deserve gratitude. There's certain laws that between man and man, that, that, that God can't forgive you. Can't forgive you that. Only humanity can forgive you that. Like if I wrong you, I can't ask God to forgive. I have to ask you to forgive them. At the core of what Lagba Omer is about, this holiday that we're celebrating, this long holiday of Omer, just so it's clear, by the way, what does the word Omer mean? Anyone know? So the word Omer is actually a measure. Right? It happens to be that during this time, the Omer, the Midah, the measure is a barley offer. There's one other time that we bring a barley offering, and that's with the Isha Sota. She also brings a barley offering. Right? This is a woman that was accused of adultery. She brings a barley offering as well. And there's, there's a relationship between the two offerings. The idea, I think, is like this. If we're meant to elevate ourselves in something more, right? how do we do that? What does that mean to elevate ourselves? Let me, let me explain to you what I mean. You see, each one of us are born with a very specific set of nature, right? You are born, whether you believe in the mazalot, whether you believe it's just your DNA, right? We have certain, you know, we have certain traits that define us, and some of them are inescapable, right? Some of us get angry very quickly, we get frustrated, we get anxiety, whatever it is, right? Those are things we're just born with. Now, this is a very difficult idea for most people today to kind of internalize, but it shouldn't be for you guys. Are you defined by your emotions? Do your emotions define who you are? If I'm feeling angry, does that mean I should be angry? If I'm super hyper excited, does that expression of my emotions, should that determine my reaction to the circumstance I find myself in? Or is it something different? Or am I meant to be someone who's, who's Intellect is defining the reality and the response that there is. Right? This is intuitive principle. Right? There's a famous story of a, uh, this is Rabbi Yaakov Kinyaski, the disciple of Gaon, or Chaim Kinyaski's father, who's uh, 
there was a man who comes to him and says to him, Rabbi, I have crazy anger issues. I'm about to lose my wife, my kids, my family, my job. Out of control. So he says to him, okay, he's like, I can help you. He's like, I can heal you. He's like, really? He's like, how? He's like, I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to, you have to look at me, okay? Don't avert your eyes from looking at me the whole time. We're going to start in a minute. She says, look at me and don't turn away. So he says, okay, I'll look at you. What do you do? So anyway, the rabbi starts making all these angry faces. Like, and like, starts making like, all these like anger, emotive faces at him. And he says to him, like, what are you, rabbi, what are you doing? It's been like eight minutes of you making like, these weird faces at me. So he says, I want to show you what you look like when you're angry. You look crazy. <laughs> what are you doing? He's like, before you get angry, look at the mirror and see what your anger is causing. Right? Think about what you're doing. The midah that we're supposed to be working on right now is the fact that there's supposed to be a measured response in how we respond to the world around us. Right? The barley offering is an offering for animals. The wheat offering is what we bring in Shavuot. It's for bread. We bring Shavuot. Right? That is for human beings. We want to transcend the animal nature and ascend to being something called an Adam. The Vilna Gaon says there are five different words that are used to express man. You have the word Adam. You have the word uh, you get. You have the word gever. You have the word enosh. You have the word ben adam and ish. And he says those five uh, descriptions of man represent five different tiers of a, of a human being. Adam being the lowest from the earth, and ish being the highest, coming from an ish, the fire, the flame. Why is ish considered to be the greatest expression of man? Well, let's think about fire for a minute, right? Fire is something that is consuming all the time, right? Consumption, constant consumption, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends, right? If, if I was in a constant of consumption, it would be a very, very bad thing, right? But if I'm consuming for the sake of returning and giving back, right? Is that a bad consumption? Why am I taking? If I'm taking to give, if I'm going out to make money and give back, if I'm building beautiful homes, like I told you, know, we moved from Brooklyn to live here. This was a two years ago, it was a very hard decision. We spent two and a half years with an architect figuring out how to legally get every single inch into that house. Basement, you know, glass rooms, attics that are gonna collapse and expand somehow. Every single kind of you know legal shtick I could find, I figured it out. It took me two and a half years to do it. We were at November 14th, 2019, right? We were on a rage show. That was the last time I was on a show called Rage, right? Right before COVID. We're at a Shabbat Tone, and um, we're, uh, we're staying at the Rachmanis, which is where my neighbors right now. And they're like, they're like, you're crazy. Go, don't knock your house down. Don't do it. Something like, the whole world could go crazy any minute. So many things could go wrong. Don't bother doing it. Just buy the house next door. The guy's been selling it forever. He's like, you'll get a, you'll get a great deal on it. There's absolutely no work. And just move in. It's a moving condition. You'll be great. So I said to my wife, we'll just spend like, a week out of Brooklyn. You know, she's like, friend, this, that. I'm like, okay, we'll go take a look at it. We take a look at it, she fell in love. We made an offer and they accepted it and that was the beginning of an amazing journey, right? I'm sharing this because sometimes you have to go, you have to go, you have to go right? The reason why she wanted that house is because she had more bedrooms in that house than the house we were building in Brooklyn. Right? Back. What's that? Go all the way back. I don't know. She's actually considering moving back now that my son is getting engaged and might be moving to Brooklyn, so she's actually considering it. <laughs> but we'll see. Let's go wherever my wife tells you to go. So uh, we, uh, we, uh, we end up, uh, she says she wants this house not because of the size, she wants the house because she's constantly always trying to figure out where she can host all our guests who are living here, and it's almost impossible to find beds for people. Right? And she wanted a place where she could just house people and not worry about it. So she has nine bedrooms in that house. Right? We never have a problem finding housing for anyone. Because between my house, my neighbor's house, my other neighbor's house, they could have a shelter from right there for us. Right? Unbelievable. Right? That's what she wanted. She got this house because she wants to be able to give back. It's okay to take, to consume. That's what an ish is. An ish is a human being that is able to take, take fuel, turn it into light. Turn it into heat and energy and give back to the world and make yourself so profound. Right? So how do we how does that work with our relationships with each other? If you look at this room, there's a nice cross section of different kinds of people in here. More observant, less observant, interested, not so interested, not sure yet, figuring it out, and so forth. Right? 
the way in which we as Jews build a healthy future for ourselves is through something called Atu, through unity. Right? This is something called uh, uh, achieving oneness. And we see this as follows. So this is the precursor, by the way, to Matan Torah. It says the Yisumari Pidi, the first in Shemot and Exodus says, that the Jewish people journey from a place called Rishidim, by a whole movement of our Sinai, and they to the Midbar Sinai Desert, by Yatnu Bamidbar, and they encamped in the desert, and the word there by Yatnu in plural, and then it says, by Yichan Shah Yisrael Negadar, and the Jewish people encamped there in the singular for the mountain. So the, the sages ask, why does it switch uh, uh, what's the word here? Why does it switch from the singular to the, uh, to the, uh, to the plural to the singular? So she says, the reason why it switches is, the Yishe Shah Yisrael, I haven't done it in a long time, the Yishe Shah Yisrael, the Yishe Shah Yisrael, when the Jewish people were able to achieve this state called the Yishe Shah Yisrael, not the Adam Yisrael, the Yishe Shah when we reach the state of becoming individuals who understood the purpose of life, it's like I can take from the physical world around me in order to give back to humanity, to make the world a better way to play. When we got that kind of clarity, that is what allowed us to be able to receive this thing called the Torah, the instruction manual for life. That is when we were able to build this relationship where Ami Shal said, Zekir, they were able to point up and say, wow, there's God. Right? That kind of clarity only comes from unity, my friend. We are mourning the fact this is the result of, you know, the, the mourning of uh, Rabbi Akiva students. 24,000 students who missed this message. How do you get that message? But it's so easy to lose yourself in the world of spirituality when you're so engrossed in the study and so engrossed in the thinking and connecting to this massive infinite source. You lose yourself. But God created the world with humanity in it so that you can find Godliness. How do you find Godliness in humanity? you got to remember that each person in this room was created to set up Elohim in the image of the Lord. And there's a lot of people who passed away recently. You know, Zachary Walsh is one of them. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's a very interesting person, a very special person. I had, a, I had the privilege of knowing him for quite some time. And um, I remember many years ago, as I was in Israel, I was a student, and one of my rabbis, Rabbi, passed away. And I was going to the funeral. And on the way to the funeral, I said to the rabbi, you know, I was curious, this is a very a sensitive question, I thought, looking back, it's a bit sensitive. But I was just curious. I said to him, like, you know, if, if Jews believe that when someone dies, they go to heaven, why are we mourning at the funeral? Like, we should be throwing a party, like, have a seyu, like, like, make a seyu, make a kiddish, you know, like, bring out shawarmas and vodka, and like, let's make a party out of it. So he said to me, Ruben, he's like, at the very least, you could you understand that bottom line is we miss someone. They're no longer here. So I said, I hear that. But he said something else to me, which I love. He said, every single person in the world has a unique ability to express godliness in their unique way. It's something that they can do and that no one else in the world can do. Each person in this room has a special power of reflecting God's light into this world in, in their unique way that no one else in the world can do. And then one of the things that we're mourning, aside from the loss of that person, is the fact that that expression of godliness is no longer here. And then the question we ask ourselves, well, what are we doing to bring that light, that expression of godliness to the world? How do we express godliness in the world? Does anyone know? What does that mean? What does that look like? Do you know how you express godliness in this world? By being a mensch? By being normal? By being respectful? By loving your parents? By feeling gratitude? by standing up and taking initiative when no one else wants to take initiative. That's, that's how you express God. We come from a world that's just, you know, it's Darwinism, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a might make right, right? It's a viral exhibit. That's the world that I want to be a part of. No, that's not the world I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of a world where I believe in humanity's ability to recognize every single person's strengths, to recognize that we all have strengths and weaknesses, but it's irrelevant because bottom line is we have one threat that unites that we are the children of God. That every single person here has something profound to contribute. Every single person here has a unique mission. Every single person here can make a difference. But if you live in a world where it's only about you, where you're only thinking about yourself, your definition of religiosity, your expression of Judaism, your way of listening. You're not open to learning from people. You're not open to asking questions, looking for them. You're not willing to learn. 
you were no different than Rabbi Shimon and his son in the day, coming out of burning the world. So, what do we do on Lag Bomber? We stop all the, uh, the morning, we have all these activities, and remembering the fact that Rabbi Shimon was able to transcend the, this lower part of himself, right? Something much more, much more profound, much more balanced, much more healthy, much more uh, um, uh, malleable, much more digestible, palatable to us. Because there's no question that every single one of us has the ability to connect to God. 100% you have a powerful connection to the glory of Allah, and there's a journey there. The Torah is your guidebook. It will tell you how to get there. It will tell you what it tells you how to find all this. But if you're not really the sea, the greatness of humanity, you're always going to be disconnected from God. You can't find God if you can't find the beauty in the people around you. It's not an accident if you're a healthy religious person that you're also generally a very giving, kind person. You're someone who loves to help out. You're someone like, I live in a community of people who you make a phone call and say, can, I, can you host a bunch of Russian kids from some other community? Like, how many can I, how many, yeah. how many can I take? Right? It's a yeah. weird thing. Your home is the most private space in the world. Why do you share, why do you share that with strangers? You're sharing that with strangers because those people understand the beauty and the power of connecting to people. I'm hoping that... <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm hoping that each of you, thanks, thanks. I'm hoping that each of you walk away with the following, the following idea. You walk away with the idea that you, my friends, can become, can become an ish, right? That the more united you are in this group, thank you so much. I made a breath talk earlier. That's okay. You're, everyone at their level. Actually, it's not like <laughs> 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 My hope, my blessing to each of you as you walk away from tonight with the clarity of understanding that you are a spiritual nuclear power plant of infinite potential. That you have the power of uniting the people around you. That you have the power of doing great things. You have the power of connecting with people around you and amplifying your uh, your uh, your ability of, uh, of connecting and helping the people. The Rage Mission is it's still very much important to me. I've said this to everyone here, and I'm saying it publicly again. If I can do anything ever, anyone here at any level, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to be anywhere. Um, but I also always believe, and I, we've spoken about, Ronnie and I have spoken a lot about this many, many years ago, that the only way Rage has a future is if the people that graduated from Rage felt a deep sense of responsibility to give back to it. And that ultimately, that if we create all this, the classes, the rabbis, trips, Shabbaton, the experiences, speakers, connections, like we did all that. I mean, marriage, I just did my like 500th wedding back there, but I married a couple in this house, by the way, you know that? Yeah. Uh, married this couple right over here. Yeah, uh, nice. Jason and my These are the, this is the wedding document right here. <laughs> and uh, I just married them in the back. You guys are sleeping. I'm marrying people. We do that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 I got to my witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so um, we, uh, we, you know, like, we, if you were unable to walk away with, uh, you know, the feeling of gratitude for everything that these people have done for us, then we failed you as a community. We fail. Rage failed if we were unable to inspire its alumni to get up and feel a sense of indebtedness and gratitude to give back. How do you do that? There's a thousand ways to give back. You could ask Rebecca, you could ask Rebecca Sid, you could ask Rachel, you could come and ask me, ask Ronnie. We all have to ask, as I have to say, there's a thousand ways to give back. And I want you to know, right? Get a little apocalyptic on you, right? As we're nearing these interesting times in history, okay, wars in Ukraine, the world, you know, it's, it's a crazy time in history. And uh, we, what we learned over the last two and a half years, at least what I learned over the last two and a half years, the world can change very quickly, right? Um, you know, there's, uh, I never thought I would live in a country where it's all over right now. Like that was something that didn't happen. Like, imagine like there's like wine and people buying clothes up two years ago. There's toilet paper crazy. People are going crazy for toilet paper, right? And now there's there's a shortage of baby formula in this country. That, 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 that there's, they're restricting how much formula you can buy per family. That's insane. Like this is 2022. We shouldn't be doing this. Right now. It's not a matter of reality. But all of this indication, you know, the world changes very quickly. 
there's one constant, and that's us, and how we respond to our circumstances. I can't change what happens with Putin and his war in Ukraine. I can't change the war, but I can change my response. I have, I can donate. I can get up. I have, I have students at at, uh, at Safa that actually flew out to Ukraine to, on, to the border and helped refugees like just escape and, and 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 just like get into like out of the country and so on and so forth. There's a thousand things you can do. Nothing can go that far. You can do things. You have so much power. You're more. You have more power than you can possibly imagine. You, my friends, are American, Russian American Jews. You are the most powerful group of Jews on the planet. The only thing that you were lacking was like General Schwarzkopf after 9 11. They asked him, they said, you know, what, where was the failure of intelligence in America? You know what he said? He said, there was no failure of intelligence. He's like, it was a failure to match our imagination. We knew everything. We just couldn't imagine. Your weakness is not believing in your potential. Believe that we could accomplish anything together. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you.